Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. say amen. amen. I feel like we've already had a full blessing. I think we're ready to go home, but I, I do have a couple things I need to tell you. So uh, Today is the uh, final part of our five-part series on uh, removing the obstacles that our vision may be revealed. And uh, we, as I mentioned, we do honor all paths, and so I want to honor the Yankees for a moment. <laughs> Yankees legend Yogi Berra, who passed away in 2014, was an 18-time All-Star. Berra appeared in 14 World Series as a Yankee, and he won 10. His contributions to MLB history are incalculable, but his legacy might be even better remembered for what he contributed to the English language. A sports writer's favorite, Berra had countless expressions and turns of phrase that were memorable, mostly because they didn't make any sense. And yet they had truth. So these are yogiisms or Bara-isms, but there are many of them, and I'm just going to share a few of my favorites with you now. You can observe a lot by watching. <laughs> it's deep. It's deep. <laughs> Baseball is 90% mental, and the other half is physical. <laughs> a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. <laughs> I thought this was really sage advice. Always go to other people's funerals, otherwise they won't go to yours. <laughs> I usually take a two-hour nap from one to four. Slump? I ain't in no slump. I just ain't hitting. <laughs> and this is my favorite. Love is the most important thing in the world, but baseball is pretty good, too. Go Astros! <laughs> So as I mentioned, we've been doing a five-part series, removing the obstacles that the vision may be revealed. In Proverbs 28, 29, 18, it says, without a vision, the people perish. We are evolutionary creatures. There is something that is always wanting to be revealed as the next, the greater, the, the larger, the expanded version of our own being and our own experience in the world. That there is always more. No matter how good your life gets, there is more. No matter how rotten it is, there is more. It can get better. There is something always shifting. And if we are applying the spiritual principles that we teach here in unity and in, in new thought, then we can begin to, to see a greater version of ourselves, a greater experience of our own giftedness, a greater experience of, of financial freedom and, and physical well-being and contribution in the world. So that's what we're about. The vision, if you remember me saying, I've said it all four weeks but up until now, that it's not something you're going to check off a list. It's not something you're going to accomplish. The vision is something you step into, you embody, you become. And the vision of your next greater yet to be it's a feeling. It's something that is calling you. you. You may get specific things about it. I'm going to be teaching these principles worldwide. I'm going to be writing that book. It may be something like that, but it's not, it's not something you can do right now or that you have all the answers for because you must evolve into it. God does not call the equipped. God equips the called. And this process of removing the obstacles, of healing your old beliefs and limiting ideas, that is the very way that you gain the strength and the awareness of who you are. So your problems are your friends. Everybody say, the problem is my friend. 
I heard you choke on that one. I, you didn't want to say it, did you? I know. You didn't want to, but I'm telling you it's the truth. So today, the final obstacle, the week two, we talked about using denial and affirmation, classic new thought principles. The th third week, we talked about forgiveness. Last week, we talked about our relationship with the body. And today, we're talking about harmful habits. Lock the doors. <laughs> I know you've been telling me, he said, Pastor, you've been reading my mail. You know, the old joke, I told it last week, there, there comes a point where it says, you know, preacher, you have done quit preaching and you've gone to meddling. So I'm not going to start meddling. We'll get there in a moment. What I'm talking about today is habits, habitual patterns of thinking and behavior. Not all habits are harmful. Many, har many habits are helpful. We get into good habits. Many habits are harmless but it is those harmful ones that we're talking about today. The way I've come to understand it, uh, Jim, you know this thing Jim Terrell does, where you've seen him do this. Everybody just do this. It feels good. Don't hit your neighbor, though. Imagine that this is the ceaseless, endless flow of divine creative energy. It's always happening. It's always moving. It's always generating some creative something. And we, as co-creators with spirit, of directors of this energy, we align it. We get it moving in our own lives. And we say, oh, it's going to do this. And we create beautiful forms. And the forms pass away. But that beautiful, ceaseless flow, these kids have got it, I'm telling you. They're good. <laughs> it's, gonna, it's always happening. And what we do with our harmful habits, the way it's come to me, is that it's like diverting some of the necessary energy into places where it can't reach our vision. Because your vision needs a lot of energy. It needs your power. It needs the divine power within you to, to reveal itself. And our harmful habits, they take that energy. And our work is to find to see, to become aware of, to become conscious of the ways that we are siphoning off our own inheritance of divine creative energy, where we have been using it unconsciously and automatically in a way that does not support the vision of our lives. So how and why are these habits formed? Well, often I find for myself a harmful habit is formed as an emotional response, or to, uh, it's sort of a wrong way to meet an, an emotional need. If you're, if you're feeling stressed and anxious, have you noticed that a carbohydrate is the best thing? <laughs> Eating your feelings works, right? No. But it's something that we condition ourselves to do, right? I know that's not just me. It, that's an example. Again, I'm not meddling, just I'm talking about me up here. But there is, there, is an, there is a real and honest, authentic emotional need. I'm feeling something. I'm uncomfortable. I'm stressed. It's asking for our attention. And if we can't bring it the conscious awareness that it needs, we will find some way to distract. And after a while, the habit is formed. Habits can be a good thing. It's a way of offloading brain power. When I first moved to Houston six years ago, um, I had lived in big cities before, but... Driving in Houston is an experience. <laughs> and I would use, you know, Google Maps or ways to get me around, but I wasn't learning the city, so I made a point of not using those apps and really learning how this, these freeways work and where it's all going. And I was exhausted. Took a lot of energy, conscious awareness of where I'm going on this freeway. You know, this morning, I got here, and I have no memory of it. <laughs> I have offloaded that 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 work of getting in my car and getting to unity, it happens by habit. It's automatic. And there's nothing wrong with using one this way. They can be energy savers. But they can also become corrosive and life depleting. This is a very famous little autobiography in five short chapters by Portia Nelson. Many of you know this, and if you don't, you're going to enjoy it. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost, I am helpless, it is not my fault, it takes me forever to get out. Chapter 2. I walk down the same street, there is a deep hole in the sidewalk, and I pretend I don't see it. I fall in, again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it is not my fault. It still takes a long, long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it's there. 
I still fall in. It's a habit. <laughs> my eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it. I walk around it. And chapter 5. I walk down a different street. Did you get it? That's, a, that's your autobiography too, right? You've done that. We've all done that. Those habits of patterns of behavior that we fall into without knowing we're there. And after a point, it becomes so corrosive to our lives that we have to figure out a different way of doing it. And I just want to say a word about addiction. There is a point where a habit turns into addiction, and you always are going to need help. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. And I don't care how you get help, but if you are in active addiction, seek help. And uh, I will tell you that those who, with bad cups of coffee and smoky rooms, saved my life and some steps. So I just want you to know that the help is there if you need it, if you're in active addiction. So that's how habits get formed. How do we get out of them? How do we come to that moment of clarity, that moment of a possibility of doing it differently, of, of reintegrating the lost energy this story from the Gospel of John came to me over and over again. Mary Morrissey teaches from this, this story quite a bit. It's one of the, the healing stories of Jesus. And you know, I always like to, not always, I often say, when I'm teaching one of these stories from the Bible, many of us come from different paths and different backgrounds, that what the Native Americans would often say before telling one of their great stories is, I don't know if any of this happened, but I know it's true. <laughs> and that's what I know about this story as well. I don't know if it happened just this way, but I know there's great truth for us here today if we're open to it. Sometime later, Jesus went to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blame, the, line, the blind, and the paralyzed one who had been there as an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for such a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. Did you catch how long that guy had been sitting there? 38 years. Sounds like a habitual behavior, doesn't it? For 38 years, he was trying to get well. He was hanging out by the pool of Bethesda, waiting for the angel to trouble the water, and if he could just get someone to help him, he could be cured. For 38 years, he sat in church, I'm sorry, by the well, <laughs> on a spiritual path of healing, just waiting for the help he needed to, have, to get healed, right? And then the teacher, and Jesus in the story represents that Christ mind, that, that unified consciousness of wholeness that comes in and says, do you want to get well? In the King James, it said, would you be made whole? And what does he say? I have no one to help me. You see, that is the harmful habit. It is thinking that there's only one way I'm going to get where I need to go, and I can't get there. That belief in a, la a lack of... I, a limited idea of how I'm going to get to my vision. That is the, that is the habit of uh, belief. That, and then Jesus said, I didn't ask you that. He didn't say that. That's what I, my paraphrase. <laughs> Do you want to get well? I have no one to help me. That was not my question. To break a harmful habit, you've got to meet the Christ mind. You have to have a moment of hearing that question, what do you want? And when you begin to answer with your limitation, you know you're still in the habit of false belief and limited identity. 
When I lose 20 pounds, I'll start dating again. Well, when I save enough money, when I'm old enough, I'm too young, I'm too old, you know, whatever it is, there's some idea that we have that if I could just get that, then maybe I could be healed. The moment of healing in this story comes when you're face to face with that false belief. I believe that to heal a, a, a habit, a harmful habit, you got to first get awake. You've got to see what you've been doing. You've got to recognize the, the limited nature of your own methods and be open to a higher idea. Amen? And that's what this story is trying to show us. I wasn't going to share this story from my own path, but um, I was with my friend Kathy Young, and we were talking about something going on in her life, and I said, well, you know, that's that story about me at Agape. And she's like, I don't know that story. She'd never heard it. So if you've heard it, I invite you to listen with different ears maybe, and if you haven't, maybe this is for you this morning. I was called to ministry at 15, but um, I got out of it. Whew! There was really no place for me in the, the tradition of my upbringing, so I was a, a professional musician having a fun life, and oh yeah, there was some addiction in there too, but it's okay, you know, I was doing all right. As some of you know the story, I was invited to sing at a New Thought Church when I was singing at a, a piano bar in Dallas, Texas, and um, I thought, what kind of a minister goes into a piano bar to hire their musicians? Maybe I found my church, and I did. <laughs> and over time, I, I began to uh, release some harmful habits began to clumsily practice the principles I was taught in these churches. And my life began to work a little bit better. And I began to get an expanded view of what I might be able to be and do in this life. And I remember I was in this place. I was, about a, I was exactly a year sober. I remember when it was. It was year 2000. So I would have been 34 years old. I'm, my life is beginning to open up. And I go to attend the, uh, the Agape International Spiritual Center's second musician's convocation, or um, symposium it was. And so I was there, and let me just tell you, I am wide open. I love the music from Agape, the, 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 the spirit. If you ever get a chance to go to L.A. on a Sunday, you should go. You open the door, and you feel unconditional love in the parking lot. It's an amazing thing that they have created there, Michael Beckwith and Ricky Byers Beckwith. And so I'm there. I'm in the room, where, and we've, I've been singing those songs for years, and every session I'm just getting fed. I'm just getting met because I'm open. And I can feel myself expanding with possibility with what might want to happen in my life. I had not yet released my first New Thought album, but I had done the tracking. It was in the can. And on the last day of the conference, we're doing visioning work with Michael. And he's the guy that created this, step, this process of asking questions of the, uh, the knowing field and seeing what wants to happen. And, and I'm ready. I mean, I'm ready for something big. Do you get me? I can feel myself expanded and open. I'm ready for some message from the, the great divine mind within to tell me this is what is yours to do. And the first question comes. Ricky Byers is over there playing the piano, this beautiful meditation music. And Michael Beckwith says, what is the high vision for my life and my ministry? And I heard a voice say, who are you kidding? Even if you get your stuff together, you're never going to do what Ricky Byers does. My heart broke. I know that voice. I'd heard it for 34 years. Who are you kidding? Who do you think you are? I can still feel the pain of that moment. It's so real. It's like, it ha it's, like it's happening now. This pain of wanting to be more and being so terrified that I can't, that I'm not good enough, that I, can, I will never be this thing that I think wants to be me. But I had a moment of grace right then. A couple of weeks earlier at my church in Dallas, a friend of mine had spoken and he misquoted Theodore Roosevelt. He said this, comparison is the death of joy. The actual quote is comparison is the thief of joy. 
But in that moment when I'm heartbroken, I'm just, this critical voice in me is just taken a hold again. I have this moment. Comparison is the death of joy. And then I, I heard, felt, received a message from God or from my higher self or from the Christ mind. But what I heard, if I were to give it language, it said this, Michael, I'm seeking to give you an experience of life that is pure joy. And when you compare it to another, you shut it down. There's a phrase that we have in the church I grew up in called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's not guilt and it's not shame. But it is a deep, painful awareness. The burden of what I had been doing to myself my whole life, I saw it. I saw the falseness of it. I saw the thief that it was. And I said, no more. It's the only spontaneous instant healing I've ever had in my life, and it took 20 years of therapy to get there. <laughs> but in that moment, I got it. I don't have to be Ricky Byers. That position is filled, and beautifully. But Spirit was waiting for Michael God to show up. And so I started showing up imperfectly, making a lot of mistakes, having to ask forgiveness a lot, still getting in some little funny tidewaters of harmful habit across the way. But I kept showing up. And whenever I would think about comparing who I am to who I thought I ought to be, it was just, I don't do that anymore. And then something happened. Over time, I expanded. Over time, I was given opportunities. Like when my, my mentor and teacher, Reverend Peter Weldes, said, you, you should think about ministry school. First, I would have gone, no. I thought, well, Maybe. The rest is history. All habits are mental pathways. The most difficult ones to change are the habitual thoughts of negativity and self-criticism. There is nothing standing between you and your vision. This whole talk about removing the obstacles, they ain't there. They're not real. They're not real. It's the lie you tell yourself. I can't get to the pool because I don't have you, you, whatever your list is. It's not real. Would you be made whole today? Would you be willing to step into who you are and who you're called to be? Something is happening here. I can feel it. It's in me, and it's in you. It's right over here. God is up to something. Let's say yes. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.